What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, it's some of my final thoughts ahead of the game week 28 deadline. So as always, I'm going to go through the key press conference information, answer some of your questions, and then take a quick look at my team as well. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button, and make sure to check out Fancy Football Hub if you haven't done so already. They've got a seven-day free trial at the moment and up to 30% off. All the links you need are in the description below, and they've got both yearly and monthly deals too. So make sure to check that out. Otherwise, let's jump into it. So considering they've got a double game week this week, let's start with Bournemouth. This is what was said in the press conference. So Marcus Sanessi is ruled out until after the international break with a hamstring strain, which we pretty much knew was going to be the case anyway. Um, which game week after the international break he's going to be back for? I don't know. From what I could tell, that wasn't really mentioned. So is it going to be game week 30, 31, 32? We're not really sure. Personally, if you've got him, it's massively frustrating. I get it. I think I would just transfer him out, even if that's for a four-point hit and just get a different um, Bournemouth defender. For me, it would be Zabani. I would just play safe with the minutes. But Kirkes and Smith should continue to start while Aarons and Kelly are out, and they are... As far as I know, not back this week. So you're definitely all right for game week 28. I guess it depends how long you need that player for. For those of you like me that are thinking of wildcarding late, so maybe game weeks 35 or 36, you might want that Bournemouth defender for game weeks 30 and 31, which is um, Everton at home and Palace at home. I personally would just go for Zabani. But if you want to go for someone that's maybe slightly more attacking, one of the fullbacks, by all means, go for that. Um, Solanke... A little bit like last week, hasn't trained fully this week, is what the manager has said. Hopefully, oh, sorry, he's hopeful that he can play. Now, luckily, um, there was kind of like a full transcript of what was said in the press conference on Bournemouth's website. So this is it. Dom is in a similar position to this past week. He hasn't trained fully with the team. We are trying to put him in the best positions to play tomorrow. Hopefully, he'll train normally this evening. With his feelings, we will take the decision much like we did last week. So it's all going to be about how much pain Solanke is experiencing and whether he thinks he can play. Um, he's been playing through pain. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. We're trying to manage it with these two games we have. We don't want to put too much training on him. It kind of reminds me of um, maybe like Ledley King at Spurs. You know when he didn't try, as far as I know, right, he didn't train between games because his knee. I think it was a knee issue he had. Um, but he kept playing on the weekends, but it was just too much to also train during that. I'm not saying Solanke's um, issue is as bad as that was, but it does sound kind of similar, right? That they're having to relax the amount of training he does just so that he's not experiencing a huge amount of pain uh, during the games. I could be completely wrong on that. It just reminded me of it. Um, where did I get to? He's someone who has played and trained a lot of minutes. He's been very robust this season, and maybe he doesn't need to train as much as other players. I hope he can play as many min minutes as he can, but it's something we're dealing with. Um, and then it goes on about uh, Senesi and Tyler Adams. So for me, there's no... I'm not particularly panicked about Solanke based on this. And the reason is he keeps playing 90 minutes, right? Okay, he only played 88 against Burnley, but before that it was lots of 90-minute matches. Now, potentially, the pain is a lot more now than it has been. And maybe he does need that extra bit of rest. But I think the fact that he keeps starting wouldn't be a massive worry. And because Bournemouth's double is so much better than Luton's, and the fact that like Harlan is away to Liverpool, I, I just don't... In terms of captaincy, i just not really panicked about it at all. It's not like there's another Bournemouth midfielder, or no, sorry, another Bournemouth attacker, or a Luton attacker that is like so close to Solanke this week in terms of how good they are as a captain pick. So for me... The captaincy decision is still pretty easy. Is it a guarantee that he starts both of these games? Not necessarily. Remember, he has missed FA Cup games before that have been midweek. So potentially he plays against Sheffield United and then they have to wait and see how bad the pain is for the Luton game. So potentially he only starts once. But I think it's still more likely than not that he starts twice. At the very least, he's going to come off the bench against Luton. And for me, that is just enough to captain him. Like if Harlan had Burnley at home, and this news came out about Solanke, maybe I'd worry a little bit more. But I just think he's so far clear of all the other options from Luton and Bournemouth that I'm still going to captain him. Now, for those of you with the triple captainship, you are probably slightly more worried because even though it's just one extra score with that chip, people put a lot of emphasis on it. And it can be, it can be a big chip, right? So I get that. Whether or not I would play the triple captain this week, like if you're worried about this Solanke stuff, Depends on what other chips you've got. 
If you're looking to wildcard and free hit after 29, and then you've also got your bench boost to use in 37, you're going to run out of double game weeks to also use your triple captain chip. You could go in a single game week, like when Salah's got Sheffield United at home, for example, in 31. Son's got Luton at home in 30. But I still don't think that's better than just going for Solanke this week. If you've already got rid of your bench boost, right, and maybe you're using the wild card or free hit now, so you've only got one chip to use later this season, you could not triple captain this week and go for someone else. But I, I, I just don't think I can sit here and guarantee you there's going to be a better option because most of the doubles for um, players like Haaland, Salah, Son are probably going to be in game week 37 and a lot of whether they will be good options will depend on whether the title is still open not for Son of course but like Salah and Haaland if it's not the title's done and those teams are all still in Europe so uh, City are in the Champions League Liverpool in Europa League there might be rotation and stuff like that so it's easy for me to sit here and say it because I don't have to make the decision, but I still think I would probably triple captain Solanke, especially if I've got all my chips left. If you've already used a few, then maybe you can put it off and do it in a different game, right? That's perfectly fine if you want to do that. But everyone else that isn't triple captain in, I still think Solanke is a good transfer in, and I still think he's a good captain. I just wouldn't really look elsewhere. But I do think there are slight doubts about him starting that Luton game, but again, not enough to really put me off. All right, let's move on to Spurs. This is what Postacoglu has said. Um, everyone from last week is fit and available, so the likes of Udogi, Madison, Son, etc. Coming back, Pedro Porro is good. He's trained all week. There's no problem. So he's available for game week 28, and when he's fit and available, he always starts. So for anyone that was waiting for news about Porro as to whether or not they needed to use a chip in game week 29, good news, he is back. So as long as he comes through that match without any issues, he should then play in game week 29 as well. On Richarlison, he said he's still not trained. So last week, Postacoglu said two to three weeks. There were some journalists saying that they, he said to them it was three to four weeks. But either way, probably a two to three week period out. We know Richarlison did that um, interview with ESPN in Brazil and he said that he was already back training, could even be involved against Villa. Not according to Postacoglu, he's not even back in training yet. Perhaps Richarlison was just optimistic because he really wants to go away with Brazil during the international squad. Either way, not available for 28. We didn't get, as far as I can tell, an update about how long he's going to be out for. But if we go based on what Postacoglu said last week, he is going to be in doubt for that match in game week 29. And if I had to bet on it right now, I don't think he's going to feature. So again, if you're looking to maybe sell him to someone else, I don't think that's necessarily a bad move. If you've got a team with eight good attackers, you can just bench Richarlison and you can leave the decision about whether or not to play a chip until next week, then by all means do that. But it all comes down to how your team is set up. So Porro is back for game week 28. Richarlison's still out and hasn't trained this week. Let's talk about Trippier next. This is what Eddie Howe said about him today. So Kieran's injury is not too bad, a minor injury. The scan showed enough to probably keep him out for the next two games. And we hope that he will be back for the first game after the international break, although that's not guaranteed. So as a reminder, I'm sure you already know, the international break is between game weeks 29 and 30. So potentially Trippier could be back for West Ham at home. The cynic in me says that Eddie Howe has said that to make sure Trippier doesn't go away with England during the international break. But I could be wrong on that, right? I'm sure it's a genuine injury. But the fact he said it's not guaranteed that he'd be back for West Ham... I'm sure is also partly to keep him away from England. But again, I could be wrong on that. Um, there is every chance he travels to both games. And by both games, he's talking about Chelsea away in game week 28 and the away game against Man City in the FA Cup. He is very keen to stay with the group despite the injury. It highlights his leadership qualities. Do you know what? I Look, I think from everything that's been said, Trippier is out of game week 28. But there is a part of me that wouldn't be completely shocked to see him in the first 11 because one, Eddie Howe has said he's going to travel with the group despite the injury. And right at the start, he says to probably keep him out for the next two games. So does he mean there's a chance he could play in either of those games or does he just mean probably the next two, but it could be more? It's hard to say. I think we have to take it that he's going to miss game week 28. So then we have to uh, discuss whether or not to sell him. You've got a blank in 28 if he's going to miss it through injury and a blank in 29. The fixtures for Newcastle after the blank are pretty good. So they've got West Ham at home and Everton at home. Two fixtures you wouldn't be too worried about having to play Trippier in. And then after that, it is Fulham away in 32. Spurs at home may be a bit more difficult in 33. And Man United away in 34. But potentially, based on the FA Cup results, that game week 34 
could be a double for Newcastle. So overall, the only game there you'd really be worried about is Spurs. So potentially, even if he's out of 28, if you've got a good enough defense to not worry about that, you could hold on to him a bit longer. The only thing I would say is Trippy is quite expensive at 6.8 million. And if he does double, he'll probably be one of those players you'd you'd you would want. But if you're trying to fit in Salah, who's back now fit, and Harlan and Saka and Foden and Son, it gets quite difficult to also have someone like Trippier as well. So if you're stuck between whether to sell him or not, I would start putting some of those players in that you think you're going to want from game week 30 onwards. And if you find it's tough to fit them all in, then have a think about which one you would drop. And right now for me, it would probably be Trippier. We know what he can do, especially with those good fixtures. But the Newcastle defence hasn't been great for a while now. I think most people would prefer to attack the attackers instead, like all those names I just mentioned. So I think for a lot of people, despite the good fixtures afterwards, despite a possible double in 34, it's probably a good time to get rid of Trippier, probably for um, a Bournemouth defender for most people, depending on your chip strategy, and it's just not worth holding on to. Obviously, if you're wildcarding in 30 or 31 anyway, then you can just bring him back in if needed. If you're free hit 34, then it doesn't matter about the double. You could just bring him in for that. So I think for most people, Trippy is just probably not needed. But like I said, I wouldn't be completely shocked if he shows up for game week 28. But I think it's most likely that he's going to be out for the international break and probably probably be back for West Ham. So just quickly on Wolves, Gary O'Neill confirmed that Jose Sar, Zhao Gomez and Pedro Neto are all fit and available for the Fulham game in game week 28. Also went on to say that Craig Dawson is a doubt with a sore groin and confirmed that Nathan Fraser is ready to play if needed. Now, from an FPL point of view, most of those, na- most of those names sorry, don't really matter. There might be some Jose Sar owners out there. If there are happy days, he should start against Fulham. The key name is... Pedro Neto, who some people would have picked up, especially for that Sheffield United game back in, when was it, game week 26, but he went off at halftime against Newcastle. There was word after the game that that was more of a precaution, but now he's fit and available. If you own him, I would say there's not really a need to get rid of him because Fulham at home on paper is such a good fixture. And look, if he came off against Newcastle as a precaution, will they be careful with his minutes going forward? Potentially, but I just think they're already missing Cunha and Huang. Do you really want to leave Neto out as well? Like, I wouldn't say that attack has been decimated. Maybe that's a bit dramatic, but it has been severely dented. And I think if Neto is fit and available, as Gary O'Neill said, he will start that game. So if you've got him in your team and you were looking at it thinking, I don't really want to sell him. I just want to play him this week. I would keep hold of him. If your initial plan was to sell him anyway, then obviously you can just go ahead and do that. So out of all the players mentioned in the Aston Villa press conference, the most important one for FPL is Paul Torres. And it's good news because Unai Emery said that both he and John McGinn are available for the game on Sunday against Spurs. So for anyone that that wants to get through game week 29 without using a chip and is relying on Paul Torres to play against West Ham away, this is at least some positive news. I don't think it's a complete certainty that you get minutes out of him because if we look at the recent games for him, um, he played the full 90 against Fulham in game week 25, only 45 minutes against Forest in game week 26, and then missed the Luton game completely. Now, he did start in their European match midweek, but again, he came off after 45 minutes. Now, Unai Emery did say that he decided how Torres wouldn't play more than 45, so they're obviously managing him, which is probably a good thing for Premier League minutes, but it's also not it wouldn't give me complete confidence that he's definitely going to go and play back-to-back 60-plus minute matches if they're still having to kind of manage his minutes overall. So I think my general opinion with Paul Torres is definitely don't buy him, right? There are much better defenders to buy at the moment. If he's the only concern you have about game week 29 and you don't want to use a chip, I would probably risk it, right? The fact he's available for Spurs after coming off on 45 minutes is probably a good thing overall. And if you can get through that Spurs game, you've just got to hope that he starts against West Ham uh, and then also gets past 60 minutes. So if Paul Torres is your only real concern, I would just risk it and just don't use a chip over game week 29. If you've got multiple issues starting to crop up, so Paul Torres and Richarlison, and maybe one or two others as well, then I think it's probably worth just using the chip and getting better players for game week 29 whether that's wild card in this week or for most people probably free hitting in game week 29 i just think at some point you've got to not put off using the chip i know there's potential for it to be worth lots of points down the line but if you're struggling with multiple injuries i just don't get the use of saving it if you've got 
wildcard and free hit as i've said many times now having just one of those chips later on should allow you to manage the rest of the season with i don't want to say complete ease but relative ease it's not going to be you know a massive struggle if you've got one of those chips so yeah if power Torres is your only issue fair enough just leave it if he's one of many then i'd maybe think about using a chip especially if you get even more injuries next week all right let's get into some of your questions so is harlan to morris with two extra matches worth it especially if it allows Salah in game week 30 without taking a hit. So I think I answered a very similar question on the game week preview, so I won't go into too much detail here. But in theory, if you're not free hitting in game week 29 and you're trying to get through that week without having to use a chip, I don't mind this move, right? Because you get two extra matches, one this week, and obviously Haaland blanks in game week 29. And look, could selling Haaland be painful? Yes, we know what he's capable of. But you are at least selling him before selling him before a game against Liverpool away. You would hope the damage won't be too much. You got two good fixtures for Morris and then a decent one in 29 as well. So I'd probably do it. I would keep an eye on how much money you're going to lose from selling Haaland. So again, like I showed you the other day, if you go to the transfer page, then click on list, you can see when you bought a player, or sorry, how much you bought a player for, how much you can sell them for, and what they're currently priced at. So if I sell him at 14.2 million, it would cost me 0.3 million to get him back. So be careful if you've got low team value, because ultimately you will want Haaland back. Maybe not for game week 30, but from 31 onwards, most people are going to want him in their team. On the Salah part of that question, Again, definitely good to think ahead. I think Salah in game week 30 and 31 is going to be extremely popular. And it's great that, you know, Haaland to Morris frees up that money. But the question is, is Salah a better option than Haaland after game week 30? I'm not so sure he is, apart from maybe that Sheffield United match. And so even if you free up the money, you still need to figure out another way to get the money to bring Haaland back in, if that makes sense, which might fit into your transfer plans. It's just something that I would consider right when you're making this move because look Salah against um Sheffield United at home in game week 31 if he plays that game he's going to be most people's captain but then straight away afterwards Man City have got Palace away in 32 which is pretty good and Luton at home in 33 so again Haaland's going to be massively captain that week and in game week 33 for Liverpool it is Palace at home so not bad I guess you could risk it and just go with Salah only and just completely get rid of Haaland I guess it depends how mentally prepared you are for that because not having one of those two players can hit hard, right? If if they both do really well, then suddenly it, it kind of hurts a bit. For what it's worth, I don't think going for just one premium after 30 is necessarily a bad move, but I just don't think I'm prepared to do it. I want both of these players. So if you're taking out Haaland to fund Salah, where is the money coming from to get Haaland back in? Because for most of you, if you sell him, you will want him back. All right, next question. I'm not free hitting in game week 29 and I don't have a goalkeeper. Is Kaminsky my best option to bring in this week? I think the simple answer is yes. I would just take that extra fixture over all your other goalkeeper choices and just run with it. Like in game week 28 itself, I obviously prefer Neto because Bournemouth's fixtures are much better, but he doesn't have a game in 29. And if you're looking at the keepers that do play in game week 29, they're either, either from teams where the defense isn't that much better than Luton. So like Forrest, Fulham, Burnley, for example. And if you're looking at Vicario at Spurs or Martinez at Villa, okay, they may be better than Kaminsky in game week 29, but not by a lot. And in game week 28, they play against each other. I would expect both Villa and Spurs to score in that game. Ariola's maybe the only one who has Burnley at home in 28. But again, you'd expect him to concede anyway in game week 29. So I think in this case, I would just take the extra fixture and that is it. I think we always have discussions, debate, arguments about, you know, have we gone into the double game weeks too much and ignored single game week players? And I think for attackers, maybe you can have that conversation like a Bowen versus Barkley this week, but the gap with goalkeepers is much smaller. So in this case, yeah, if you need someone for 28 and 29 specifically, I would just go for Kaminsky. So should I rip my team up to get Salah in game week 30? And I know that's a couple of game weeks away, but that might play a part in what transfers you make this week. Um, ultimately, as I've already said, I do think Salah's going to get quite popular in game weeks 30 and 31. And it is worth considering how you might be able to get him in. But I wouldn't start making drastic changes to your squad and taking loads of hits because before then he's got a game against Man City. And I think Liverpool have got their second leg in the Europa League 
and a game against Man United in the FA Cup. And Salah's only just back from injury. And I know for uh, many years now, he has been fully fit, always played. But the last time he came back from injury, he got re-injured again. Obviously, that happened recently. So I'd just be a little bit cautious about making too many drastic changes to your team in order to get him in. That being said, if you can do it easily without ripping your team up, I think he's going to be a great, almost like a differential in game week 30. Like he's not going to be like 5 or 10% owned, but he's not going to be as highly owned as he usually would be because obviously he's been out and there's a blank in game week 29. And against Brighton at home in game week 30, I would really like him for that match. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to him. A lot will depend on injuries and stuff like that after the international break. But Brighton at home, that could be a big captaincy week because that, ma uh, sorry, that game week, Man City are playing against Arsenal. So I think a lot of people will take that as an opportunity to not go for someone like Haaland. And then you've got Salah instead. The The reason why, I mean, I'm not panicking yet because it's two game weeks away. I might change my mind during the international break. But the reason I'm not panicking about game week 30 itself is because Spurs are playing Luton at home. And I can just captain Son that week instead. I mean, even Watkins against Wolves at home is not that bad. So there are other options in game week 30. Maybe even... Cole Palmer against Burnley at home. But in 31, look, Haaland against Aston Villa at home is not going to be a bad option. But if you can captain someone against Sheffield United as good as Salah, most people are going to want him in. So I think a lot of people will want him in game week 30, but maybe put that off until game week 31. But if you can get him in and he's fully fit and he's shown that for all the Liverpool games from now until that match and over the international break then yes, Salah is going to be a player that most people want to, uh, want in very soon. I've seen some people saying maybe they're going to ignore him if they're on like a late wild card because, you know, they can just wild card him back in for the doubles later on. But I just keep looking at that Sheffield United at home match thinking I cannot go without him. And look, it might be that his minutes get managed because of the injuries he's had recently, but I'm not so sure that's going to be the case. And one thing to point out for Liverpool is the game in 30 is on Sunday, and it is a midweek game week for game week 31, but Liverpool don't play until the Thursday. And I just think if Salah's fit enough to start this game against Brighton, he's also going to start on Thursday against Sheffield United. I mean, the next game after that is Sunday against Man United away. Maybe Klopp will give Salah a bit of a rest against Sheffield United to make sure he's ready for that. But I still think he would start. I just think he'd more likely come off early, like 65, 70 minutes or something like that. And if that's the case, most people would still want him. So to go back to the original question, should you rip your team apart? I don't think so, because you're not going to captain him in 28. He's playing him against Man City, right? Most people are going to go Solanke. It's a blank in 29. And I think in 30, you could potentially get away without captaining him as well. 31 onwards is a different story, though. So who's the best Bournemouth midfielder for double game week 28? And I think if money is no object, and don't get me wrong, right? None of these midfielders are particularly expensive. But if it doesn't get in the way of future moves, Tavernier probably has to be the one to go for because out of all the Bournemouth midfielders that are at least a little bit attacking, he has had the most minutes over this season. Like I wouldn't be looking at someone like Cook or Christie. They're just not attacking enough. But with Tavernier, since I think it was, yeah, game week five against Chelsea at home, he started every match apart from two, which was Palace away in game week 15. He came on, got 28 minutes. And against Forrest at home in game week 23, where he came on and got 45 minutes. Outside of that, since game week five, he started every match. And in a lot of them, he's got to at least 70 or 80 minutes. Not every single one, but most of them. Now, his attacking numbers are nothing to write home about or get excited about. 0.18 expected goals per 90, 0.18 expected assists as well. But it's not bad for a Bournemouth midfielder. So he probably has to be the one. I should say again, right, there is some talk on social media from Bournemouth fans that they want him dropped. They want someone like Sinistera to come in instead. But as I've said many times before, what fans want and what they get is not always the same. And I think based on how often Tavernier has been used this season, we have to assume he's going to probably continue to be nailed. Does that mean he starts both games in the double? Of course not, right? No one can guarantee you that. But that's the same as any other midfielder you're looking at from Bournemouth, who is, like I said, at least a little bit attacking. So I think it's got to be Tavernier. I don't think I've really changed my mind on that. Um, you could look at Cliver as well, who's only 4.6 million. Hasn't had as many starts as Tavernier, but has started the last three. Um, 70 minutes against Newcastle, 68 against City, and 72 against Burnley. And he is a bit cheaper, 4.6 million. So again, 
I know that Tavernier at 5.4 is not exactly expensive, but that difference of 0.8 million might make a difference. As I showed the other day on my team, if I do Taylor to Zabani for my defense and then do Fernandez to Clivert, that allows me to do someone like Foden to Salah in one move. Whereas if I go for uh, Tavernier instead, I can't afford Salah in just one move. Now, that might be different for you, right? You might be able to afford either of them, in which case I go for Tavernier. But just have a think about what your future transfers might be. Because if we're going to move back to two premiums, having someone like Clive at a 4.6 just to sit on your bench every week is really not the end of the world. So I would go for Tavernier, money no object. Otherwise, I'd probably just take a punt on Clive. I know this wasn't in the question, but Semenyo is also an attacker you could look at, 4.5. He has been, again, I wouldn't necessarily say he's nailed, right? But he's probably one of those attackers that's going to start more often than not. But as a forward, I just don't think you can go there unless maybe you're wildcarding in game week 29, which I don't think is a great idea. Or you can get, you know, 9, 10, 11 players out in 29 whilst also having some menu in the squad. But I just think forward spots are so precious right now. Solanke, Harlan, Watkins, there's going to be other players you want soon. I just don't think there's room for Semenya, which is why I prefer someone like um, Cliver or Tavernier instead. So if you're not free hitting next week and you need a new midfielder, would you go for Villa or West Ham? So I've narrowed it down to three options, Bowen, Bailey and Louise. Before anyone says it, I know that West Ham have other midfielders, but I don't think that Kudus is as good as Bowen. Whereas I think with Bailey and Louise, there is a conversation to be had. Uh, Pakitar, look, if he's on penalties, is not a terrible option, absolutely. But Bowen's much more likely to get you a return from open play. And Ward Prowse probably isn't going to have penalties anymore. So for me, it's only Bowen from West Ham. Um, I think the closer I get to game week 29, the more I come around to having Leon Bailey in my team. On free hit 29, there's a really good chance that happens. Obviously, no point in locking that in yet, but I'm definitely tempted by it. A few weeks ago, I would have definitely said Louise over. Bailey just for the minutes and the penalties because I'm always a little bit worried about Bailey's injury record but he has played a lot recently in that first 11 for Villa especially in um, the league so if I just go to Aston Villa I forgot I was on West Ham there uh, Aston Villa and go to Bailey who's still behind Douglas Luiz for points this season but that's not surprising given the minutes he played 78 minutes against Luton 90 against Forest 80 against Fulham 72 against Man United the minutes have been there recently and so have the attack and returns and his underlying numbers are very good. 0.3 expected goals per 90, 0.38 expected assists. Like if he gets the minutes, he is going to get the attack and returns. So I think if you're willing to risk the minutes and possibly slightly more injury concern over Louise, like just generally, right? I'm not saying Bailey has a knock right now. I just think if either of those two are going to get injured, it's probably more likely to be Bailey. He's the one I would go for. But just to get back to the question, um, I think I prefer Bowen anyway, because I would just take the Bernie at home fixture. Simple as that. Like, Villa will get chances against Spurs, because the Spurs defence is not exactly watertight. But Bernie at home is one of the best fixtures you can get. And then in game week 29, when they play against each other, of course Villa, uh, Villa can score in that game. But Bowen's at home. So two home games in a row, and one of them's Burnley. I would go there. I don't think there's anything wrong if you want to go for Bailey. He's in incredible form right now. Nothing wrong if you want to go for Douglas Luiz. Guarantee minutes, penalties as well. But I think for a two-game week only choice, I would take Bernie at home and go for Bowen. So that's my option. I wouldn't go for any other West Ham midfielder over Bowen. If you need someone cheaper like Kudas, fair enough. But if you've got the money, Jared Bowen's the one for me. And then just quickly on my team, nothing that I've seen in the press conferences today has really changed my mind on what I want to do in terms of transfers and captaincy and stuff like that. So in goal, it's Ariola, Burnley at home. I've got double Arsenal defence against Brentford at home, Gabriel and Saliba, plus Doughty with the double game week. My midfield is Palmer, Fernandez, Son and Saka. Saka is ye uh, yellow flagged with illness, I think it is. Obviously, that's why he came off apparently at halftime against Sheffield United. I've got to be honest, unless we hear any more, I'm not particularly concerned about that whatsoever. I think it'd be really unlikely for Saka not to start this weekend. It might be enough to remove for me to remove the vice captain off him, but I'm definitely going to start him. And as it stands, I'm benching Foden. Now, I'm definitely worried about that. He's been in incredible form, definitely better than Bruno Fernandes recently and for most of this season, to be fair. Uh, Liverpool could be without Canate. They're already without Alisson. It certainly doesn't feel that fun to bench him. But I think if I'm going to continue to play the fixtures as I usually do, 
I've got to play Fernandez instead. Even though, as someone pointed out to me the other day, he hasn't scored since game week 11 against Fulham away, which is absolutely ridiculous. In some ways, it makes me think, surely he's due a goal, right? He's not been that bad, but maybe he has been. But I think I'm going to play him. I'm not saying I won't change my mind, right? This is not part of some dramatic plot where on the deadline stream, I suddenly say, ah, guess what? I'm going to go for Foden. That might happen, but it's not something I'm particularly planning. And also, if I was going to plan something dramatic like that, I'd go the other way around. I'd just have Foden in my team and then last minute swap to Fernandez instead. It wouldn't make sense to do it this way around. So I am currently playing Fernandez. Then up front, uh, Harland, Watkins, and Solanke captain. So my move is almost certainly going to be Charlie Taylor to uh, Zabani. Almost forgot his name there. Because I think in game week 30, I'm going to need another, uh, another defender with a good fixture. So if I just show you on Hub here, as always, links in the description. If I get rid of Charlie Taylor for... It's actually put Kirkes and Smith here, interestingly. I think they might be better for 28, but longer term, I prefer the safety of the minute. So I'm going to put Zabani in, uh, and I'm going to make those transfers and save that plan. I'm free hitting in 29, so that doesn't matter. But in game week 30, like I said before, like Doughty against Spurs away, double Arsenal defence against Man City away, it's not very good. So if Bradley is an option, I will play him for sure against Brian at home. I'd obviously wait for updates on Trent. If he's back, then I'd probably bench Bradley instead. And the Zabani, in, uh, sorry, Zabani with Everton at home would probably play instead of Saliba. So some people are going to have Spurs defenders against Luton at home for game week 30, which is great. But my team, without wildcard in, um, or just, you know, having kept Poro recently, I'm just not going to have enough transfers to get there. But Bradley, Gabriel, and Zabani is much better than having to play double... Arsenal defence, but I don't really want to sell Saliba because in game week 31, Arsenal have got Luton at home. So if if Bradley's not an option by then, I've got Gabriel and Saliba against Luton at home, plus Zabani against Crystal Palace at home. That move this week for Zabani just helps me in future game weeks as well. So for me, that's about as much of a no-brainer transfer as I'm going to get. It's of course possible for Saliba to get a clean sheet this week and Zabani to concede in both games uh, and for that transfer not to work out. But I think it makes sense. And then I'm still considering the hit to bring in Neto with Dubravka or Ariola. I'm still a little bit unsure about this. Um, with Pope, it was said today that he's not going to be back until next month. But game week 30 is at the end of March. So next month in terms of April in general is not that far away for FPL purposes. But will it be the start of April, the middle, or the end? We just don't know. Um, in terms of potential double game weeks in game week 34, the first game of 34 for Newcastle would be the 20th of April. So for Dubravka to be a double game week option in 34, if Newcastle double that week, you really need Pope out for most of April. That being said, if I keep Ariola and buy Neto, I'm only going to play Ariola in one week, which is Fulham at home. So I'm very much torn on which goalkeeper I would sell. I think unless Neto is at risk of losing his place, which I don't think he is, then I would probably sell Ariola because I can just play Neto in every other game anyway, every other game week. And 33 against Man United at home, it's not really that much of an issue. So I, I don't know. I'm still a bit confused on that, but I think I'm going to make um, both of those moves. So my actual team in game week 28 will look a little bit like this instead. So if I just transfer out Ariola and put Neto in, uh, Bournemouth. That's it. So for a minus four, um, I've got three Bournemouth players, double game weekers, Sabani, Neto, and Solanke, who's already in. And then I've already got Doughty. And then the rest of my team is Gabriel, Son, Palmer, Fernandez, Haaland, and Watkins. I mean, that looks pretty good to me. And then the decision on Salah later on in game week 31 can just be made then. Because at that point, if Fernandez has got a double in 34, I might want to keep hold of him, which I appreciate will probably be a stupid decision in hindsight, but it's a possibility. And if he doesn't, then I can just sell him for, for Salah and fund that by selling a different midfielder, or possibly even Watkins, who's got Man City away um, in game week 31, which is not ideal. So potentially Bruno Fernandez could get sold. I know I'm, think I know I'm looking ahead here, right? We've got a whole international break yet, but Salah could come in for Fernandez, and I've got to make up 3.2 million. So Watkins out, you can basically go to anyone 5.3 or less. So maybe someone like Meniz um, at Fulham 
and that allows like i don't i'm not in a rush to get rid of watkins but the fixtures aren't great maybe that's my move to get salah and i get to keep foden saka parmesan and harland so that looks pretty good so basically my moves this week don't affect future moves all that much and i get a good goalkeeper for a good double and i've got a defender that's going to help me out in other game weeks as well so that's pretty much my team if you've enjoyed that video make sure to give it a like hit that subscribe button rate five stars if you listen on podcast and join me for the deadline stream tomorrow which will probably start at half nine uk time remember it's 11 a.m uk time uh, deadline this week because we've had two later deadlines the previous two weeks so good luck this week and i'll hopefully catch some of you on the deadline stream tomorrow if not i'll catch you for the content for game week uh, 29 i'll see you then